for having me. Uh, just by way of background, you know, two years ago I left the cosy corporate cubicle. I had to sit out six months gardening leave. And then I sort of kicked off a new business in June 2014 with my business partner, Rebecca Ferguson. At the time we had no clients, no staff, no premises, no systems and no processes. So it's been a pretty eventful journey. As I sit here 18 months on, we've now got seven staff and our biggest challenge is actually managing that growth. And I'll give you an insight in terms of some of the things that we've actually done and what we found that actually has worked through that journey. Now, with the presentation, I'm going to actually go into two areas. So one is corporate and social responsibility. And second is how we've embraced technology and really use that to leverage as a small business. With corporate and social responsibility, I've always been a big fan of engaging with the less vulnerable in the community to really sort of provide value to them. And as an example, I actually approached the Migrant Resource Centre and said, look, I want to develop a financial literacy program for you know, migrants, new, new migrants coming into Tasmania. So I developed this program. So it was somewhere between eight and 12 lectures, depending on the, uh, the topic. It consisted of workshops, PowerPoint presentations, and interactive exercise. Then we uh, approached, they approached the federal government. So now it's actually funded. So what actually happens is I donate my time, and they get the money. So every time we do it, it raises you know, ten to $15,000 for the community centre, and it's a really powerful thing to do. As an example, as an extension of that, what we did, we actually developed an ebook, which covers some very, very simple topics to you and I. But to someone new to the country, it's really powerful. And what we did, we actually sent that ebook to over 500 community centres around Australia. So I'm actually working locally, but engaging nationally. Then I actually set up a YouTube channel, and I called it Mr Simple Finance. And if you look at it, it's pretty basic stuff. But what it is, it's a lot of those PowerPoint slides with me actually explaining some of the concepts. So whether it's, do you need to lodge a tax return? What's Centrelink? All of those things. So, and for me, whilst I didn't get an economic return from that, I actually got a social return. And it's a really, it's a feel good within yourself, but it's a really powerful thing to be able to do to help those most vulnerable in the community. And I want to talk to you about the second example where I did get an economic return. So what I did, I actually wrote a book. I suspect it's on most of your bucket list and I'd actively, actively encourage you to do it. If you imagine there are two advisors. Advisor one has got his book on the table. Advisor two has got his business card on the table. But who's got more credibility? And what I tried to do was really think outside the square to promote that book. So I actually donated a copy of that book to every state library in Tasmania. So if you go to any regional centre, you'll see my book. And as you know, in regional centres, often the library is a hub of the social activity. Get a lot of work or phone calls from that. What I also did, I actually donated a copy of every of a book to every year 12 school in Tasmania. And I also went a step further than that. I used to go to a, a private school in Hobart and we had about 130 per year 12. So I actually donated for two years running a book to every year 12 lever from my old school. I actually spoke at the school. What happened to the book? I took the book home. It sat on the dining room table. Guess who read it? Guess who rang me? Really, really powerful. And so as a consequence of that, it really sort of turbocharged what I do. And it's opened up a whole lot of opportunities that I didn't think existed before. So whether it's standing up here as the Excellence in Education Award winner, whether it's appearing in industry uh, press or publications. I actually went to New Zealand for two weeks and spoke to a whole lot of financial advisors there in most of the centres around New Zealand. An amazing experience. You know, like it or lump it, people will Google you. So where you've got third party endorsement, it's a really powerful thing. And it's also opened up a number of opportunities in the, the world of podcasts, which I didn't know existed five years ago, but an absolute goldmine of information. The second thing we've done is we've really embraced technology. So technology is an enabler for a small business. It enables us to compete like never before. It works 24-7, 365 days a year. So what we've tried to do is create compelling content that people will like and share. I'll give you some examples of that. So what we've done, we've actually got a list of client testimonials. So on our YouTube channel, you'll see a playlist of client testimonials. So someone will ring up, say, look, Charles, what sort of people do you act for? I said, well, what I'll do? I'll do, Fred, I'll send you a list of our YouTube playlist. You can look at that and see the sort of people we act for. And Fred, if you've got any questions after you've looked at that, come back to me and I'll give you their phone number. Really powerful. And what you also find is because most clients haven't appeared before a camera, 
they kind of like it a bit as well. So what they'll do, they'll put it on their Facebook feed or they'll share it with friends. And also there are new developments, so whether it's advisor ratings for all of us, so who knows, but advisor ratings could be the Google for financial advisors. So we've got to constantly embrace these new technologies. We've also got a client story section, so we all act for some amazing people. And often their stories are hidden, so we've got a client story section on both our website and our YouTube channel. So I just want to tell you a story about one guy. I act for a guy called Gabe Gossage. Now, Gabe used to be a medical rep, and he used to go to conferences like this. So he'd come back home with a whole lot of pens. And his daughter, 10-year-old daughter, said, you know, Dad, surely there's something better we can do with those pens. And he said it was like a light bulb moment. So he set up a charity called Planet Pen. Now, what Planet Pen does is where there's a corporate rebranding, or where big or one of the big pen manufacturers make a mistake with their pens, they give it to Planet Pen. So what Planet Pen does, they actually transport these pens over to developing countries. So, you're probably not aware of it, but a pencil will write about 100 metres, but a pen will write two and a half kilometres. So it's actually revolutionising education globally. An amazing story. Yeah, we've created an RV book, so where we've created content. So whether it's secrets of successful investors, how to choose your financial planner, simple guide to buying a property, like we've created that. It's not our dealer group creating it, but we've created it. So we send it to clients. So yeah, it costs $500, works 24-7, 365 days a year, and you can do an ebook for around five, ten thousand 10,000 words. So it's not a big investment of time. And it's something that works over and over and over again. Developed a number of educational videos. So we all have those common questions people ask. What's a transition to retirement pension? How does super work? Media noise and investing. So we've developed a number of videos on this with charts and text. And what we do is where there's a commonly asked question, we'll email it to the client. So we're explaining it. It's not my dealer group explains, but it's us. It also shows up in Google searches, so it's really, really powerful. What I've also done, I was an early adopter in social media, and I was very conscious to build a personal brand that was actually transferable. So what I've done, I've actually registered all of the digital assets, so whether it's on Google+, YouTube, etc. I encourage you all to do the same. What I went, did, I went a step further. I actually created a personal website. Now, all the personal website is, it's just a referral engine for, the, for business. But I create the content and we control it. And that's really, really powerful. What we've done as a small business, we've embraced the outsourcing model. You've heard it earlier today. We use 99 designs for our logo. We use Fiverr and Freelance for ad hoc work. So two weeks ago, we do some work for a professional organisation. And they said, look, we need you guys to put an advertisement in our magazine. OK, no problem. So we got on Freelancer. Within 24 hours, we had it for $15. And for us as a small business, that's pretty powerful. We've got two regular outsourcers we use. One we use on the social media front, based in the Philippines. They charge $80 a month. We're very conscious of, when you, if you Googled me two years ago, that I went through to my former employer. But we've, what we've managed to do is actually convert that traffic to my new business Main Street. We have a Skype catch up once a month. They look after our keywords, so when we do a YouTube video in terms of the hashtags, all of that sort of stuff, they give us tips every month on what we should do. These guys work in it 24-7. Whilst I have worked in it, it's more of a hobby than anything. And it's changing constantly. So what worked in the past is not necessarily going to work in the future. So if we look at how we engage with Facebook today, it's very different than what we did five years ago. We've also got an administrative outsource option. So where we've got those very time-intensive tasks, we outsource them. So as an example, three months ago, we had a client come in, and he runs a successful business. Turnover about $1.5 million, three young children, a bit of debt, no insurance. But the problem he had, his sister has motor neurone disease. So well, this could be a problem. So what we did, we sent off to the outsourcer and said, yeah, this is, these are the facts. Can you actually approach every underwriter in Australia and tell, her, tell us how they'll assess it? So we this back in 24 hours. We got a sheet with all of the correspondence with a summary. There were 12 exclusions and loadings, and two underwriters would do it as a clean skin. So what we did, we got that him cover as a clean skin at standard rates. Now, what did it cost? $38.50. Not bad, not bad. We're also very conscious of using apps and embracing um, technology. So one of the things I do, with the Google Hangout. So I went, um, yeah, about six years ago, I went to a conference and I sat next to 
the global head of dimensional for marketing. He regretted sitting next to me, but I picked his brain all night. One of the things I said to him, look, who are the 10 financial planners around the world that are the most savvy in marketing? Can, I, can you give me their names? So he sent me through these names. So I contacted all 10. Five of them didn't want to know me. But the other five were happy to engage. So what we do now is every four months, we have a Google Hangout. And so what it is, I might put a question, like what's your best marketing idea you've done the last six months? How do you deal with clients in a volatile market? And so what it enables me to do is actually work locally, but engage globally. And for me, that's really, really powerful. Now, we use this iPrompt Pro there. So you probably haven't seen my videos, but if you're interested in looking at video marketing, I suggest you have a look at a couple of them. What you'll notice is that there's no arm. There's no ah. It's, it's pretty scripted and pretty, uh, it's taken a while, but I think it's reasonably professional at a, at a client level. So all I do, I've got an iPad. It sits directly under the camera. And the text, I use iPod Pro, and the text comes down. So if I don't move my eyes, you will never know I'm reading it. So you can all sound very, very professional at a very basic level. It's a free app. And what, what I've really tried to do is, I've tried to do things differently. And I've always had this motto that I want to do the things that other people won't do to get the results that other people won't get. And what I'm going to show you is something where I certainly was a bit out of my comfort zone, but hopefully you'll find it interesting. I just wanted to wish you a happy birthday. As you know, I can't sing. So I'm actually joined by Hobart's Choir of High Hopes to sing you happy birthday. Have a great day! So the High Boat Choir of High Hopes is really a homeless choir. So I ran them up and said, look, I want you guys to sing me happy birthday. Would you be happy to do that? And they wondered, I thought I was a bit of a crank initially, but I managed to convince them I was the real deal. So I turned up there, gave them morning tea, and they actually sang the happy birthday. What did it cost me? It cost me $100 for the camera guy and the editor to do that. And what I did with that, I actually sent it to clients. Now, in a small town, it became a bit of a problem because it went viral. So I'd send it to one client who'd actually send it to the other client, then I'd send it to that client for his birthday, but he'd already seen it. So, which is a good thing, I suppose. But, so I've actually put it in recess, a bit like the Essendon Football Club for a couple of years till people forget, then it'll resurface. But dare to be different. What's also important for me is this concept of peer-to-peer -peer support. I mean, we can't do it alone. So obviously industry events are fairly important. The other thing that's an absolute sort of gold nugget for me has been this concept of podcast. Um, and I've just listed some of the ones that I sort of listen to regularly. And again, that enables you to work locally but engage globally. So global best practice. Also books, like co constantly evolving and learning and I encourage you to read some of those books as well. And what we've tried to do as an office, we all do the same thing. But it's the office environment it creates a healthy workplace versus an unhealthy workplace. So what I've tried to adopt is adopt some of the, the practices that I've seen that have worked and, some, and avoid those that haven't. So as an example, we've got a whiteboard um, with our advice service team. You can actually see a client from start to finish, where they sit and what's, what's happening with that client. A lolly jar, which the children love. Um, but this concept of pick a wall. So in our lunchroom, we've got this wall that's a wall of uh, Wall Street. So in theory, it's Main Street looking down at Wall Street. But if you look at the website Pickleball, you get, there's a whole lot of things you can do. So whether it's the middle of the MCG, whether it's an aircraft carrier, whether it's the Maldives, it actually really livens up your lunchroom. Costs $300. We've got a staff photo wall. So with the staff photo wall, all our staff do stuff. So we've got one lady who works with Penny, she loves surfing. So there's a picture of her next to a surfboard with a, with a wetsuit on. It's a conversation piece for clients. So we've got that for every client, every, every staff member, sorry. Got an arcade game in the lunchroom. Cost a thousand dollars off Gumtree. Fantastic. Last Friday we played Space Invaders. A lot of you wouldn't know what Space Invaders is, but it's still a great game. And we do it like a tennis room. We have a prize. We have drinks at four o'clock on a Friday. So if people are at their desk at eight o'clock during the week, why can't they stop at four? And also we've got this concept of a bell. So whenever we have a new client, we ring this bell. 
And the bill signals that we've got a new client. And for us as a developing business, new clients are our lifeblood. So for us, that's really, really powerful. And I suppose in closing, I've got this theory that we need to improve what we do by 10% each year to remain uh, relevant and the same, because the world's changing like never before. And continuing education is part of that process. So traditionally, we've thought of continuing education as, as doing an exam or, or doing a degree at university, but that's not all. There are podcasts, there's peer-to-peer -peer learning, there are articles, there are videos, there are TED Talks, all of these things that didn't exist before. So I, I suppose I'd encourage you all to embrace these changes as you move forward. And uh, in summary, I just wish you all the best for your business this year and thank you very much for having me in Sydney. <laughs>